recording now. Go ahead. Okay. Great. Um, good morning for those uh, in the Americas. I think it's good afternoon for those um, beyond, beyond the, uh, the Atlantic Ocean. Um, thank you for joining us in this session on uh, think tank governance. Um, this is going to focus on the role of boards, uh, different kinds of boards in a think tank. And I'll try to get through my presentation plus questions within an hour. Um, but of course, if there is anything else um, that you'd like to follow up, um, discuss, uh, you can always get in touch with us and there will be a full course on governance and management later in the year. My name is Enrique Mendizabal. I'm the director of On Think Tanks. Um, and, and what I'll share with you is some of the research uh, we've done on boards um, throughout the years, but also uh, a lot of it is going to be based on my own personal experience working in various think tanks uh, in different contexts, not just in uh, developing, but also in developed countries. So um, I'll go through the presentation. There'll be moments where I will be asking you for, uh, to ask questions or I will asking you questions. Feel free to let me know via the chat uh, option that you have a question or that you'd like to, um, to say something. And um, I can unmute you um, and give you a chance to ask the question directly, or I can read the question from the chat. This is being recorded, and it will be shared um, soon after this, this webinar uh, so that you can watch it again, but also you can share it with your colleagues. So let me start by sharing a screen. Okay, great. So strategic governance for think tanks. Um, what are we going to do, to, what are we going to look at today? We're going to start with some working definitions. Um, we'll address why I think, why we think this is important. Um, we'll explore a few aspects of governance, and then we're going to look into boards, the types, the roles, and the ideal boards that exist out there. Um, but also the relationship uh, of the board with the leadership and the staff. And then I'll provide two illustrations of when boards can be very important. Uh, both in leadership transitions, so when the executive director, for instance, decides to leave um, or is forced to leave, um, and in supporting researchers' own work. Um, so let's start. What, what do we mean by governance and management? And I know there, are, there might be different definitions depending on the sector you're working in, but let me suggest that by governance, I mean the organizational arrangement, the way that the various parts of the organization are brought together and the rules of those interactions. And I think those inter the interaction bit is the important one. It refers to the nature and style of an organization ma organizational management. Now, management I see as something more practical. It refers to the practical aspects of organizational function, the team and project composition and coordination, staffing arrangements, how different teams are set up, uh, how decisions are made, the existence of line management, how line management is structured and, um, and, and driven. Now, management, the way I see it, allows the organization to deliver its mission. Why is this important? I think good governance, so that, that general arrangement will underpin good management. If the organization is a bit of a mess, if it's not very clear who's in charge, if the board and the executive director don't know what roles they should be playing, if senior management and the board are at odds with each other, then management is going to be very hard at every level. And good management is going to be necessary to deliver the think tank's mission. We always put, pay, we pay a lot of attention to research excellence, to the quality of the research that think tanks uh, produce. We pay a lot of attention to communication, to the quality and the effectiveness of communication of a think tank. We pay a lot of attention 
to the fundraising capacity of the organization. But we, we know, those who work in think tanks know, that um, this is not going to happen. You know, we're not going to get high quality research. We're not going to get effective communications. We're not going to be able to sustain the funding of the organization without sound governance and without sound management. It's going to be very, very hard, if not impossible. So it pays to pay attention to governance and management early on. As I said before, poor governance is going to affect our capacity to engage with funders and take advantage of their support. It's going to, to affect the capacity to manage those funds effectively. Money might come in, but we won't be able to manage those funds and we might actually lose them. And we could even um, get involved um, um, without intention, unintentionally, um, in, uh, in practices that might be uh, unethical and even uh, illegal in our countries. Um, with poor management, we might not be able to ensure the independence of our work from interest groups. Uh, we, we probably won't be able to learn from our successes and mistakes. Um, and we won't be able to attract the best talent uh, at different levels of the organization. Um, the re best researchers, the best communicators are not going to want to work in an organization that is not governed properly. And most importantly, in a way, is we won't be able to address shocks. And the life, the life cycle of a think tank is full of shocks from funders leaving uh, all of a sudden, from, uh, from political changes uh, in, our, in our countries, um, uh, shifting the way that uh, media uh, addresses certain topics or the interests of, of governments or policymakers on certain issues. These are shocks that affect think tanks and we need to be able to respond to them right, right away. And without good governance, without good management, we won't be able to. Now, if we sign up to the broader course, uh, which will be coming up later in the year, we'll cover a range of things. Um, specifically, we'll cover boards, we'll cover organizational and research teams, how these research teams can be organized to be more effective, and we'll cover line management and performance appraisals. There are other aspects of, uh, of governance and management that we could be addressing, but the courses tend to be shorter, so we don't have the time. In this particular webinar, we're focusing on the first um, um, aspect of this, which is boards, their strength, composition, and, and commitment. So as I said before, we'll cover now the role of boards, types of boards, the pros and cons of each type of board. Uh, we'll discuss the composition of an ideal board, uh, and then we'll talk about the relationship of the board with senior management and staff. And then at the end, I'll finish with some illustrations of how boards can help a think tank. And of course, I'll be asking you to help me out a little bit. So let me know, um, maybe um, a couple of you um, through chat or if you wish directly, what are your own board dilemmas? You know, you've signed up to this webinar. You, you must want to know more about think tank board, think tank management. Um, what are, the, what are the dilemmas that your boards are facing? Um, where do you think the boards of your organizations are not delivering 100% or where they might be failing or where they might, may need some, um, some tweaking, some adjustment? Anyone? Anyone like to share some dilemmas? Alan, yes, uh, let me unmute you. Yes, please go ahead. Alan, you can, uh, you can, you can speak now. But I can't hear you. Oh. I think there you are. I hear from Sylvester. Sylvester says, uh, strategic orientation support to the technical, technical team. Um, or there's another one that says, overloaded by, I'm very busy. Um, uh, sometimes commitment is not there. Um, one of our major board dilemmas is that our boards, of course, be non-existent little interaction between the board and members of staff. 
problems in internal communication with staff. Um, Alain, you've, you've joined uh, via chat. Um, so, and you say the tentative to address all problems. Yes, they're tempted to deal with everything. Uh, Hector, the autonomy uh, from donors, I guess. Um, micromanagement from board. No opportunity for engaging uh, or meeting with the board. Staff uh, don't, don't get to know, know the board. Um, okay, let me, let me move on then. Um, but that's, a, that's an interesting point. Um, not many people know there, not many think tankers know who the board members are because they often don't get the chance to interact with them. There's a couple more, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on, but there's a couple more there. You say, uh, there's, um, the dilemma is finding the balance between providing guidance on content and strategy and keeping pace with internal issues such as staff. And then finally, Sylvester talks about capacity for evidence-based decisions. Okay, so let's, let's there's a multiple dilemmas. Let's get into, into some of these. Now, discussion about boards, I think um, often we, we try to look for literature or we try to look for studies or um, analysis of boards in think tanks. But actually, there's a huge discussion about boards around the world uh, and not just um, related to think tanks that is, that is relevant to policy research organizations. Um, so like in, in, like in any organizations, think tanks must have a solid and appropriate governance structure to enable them to deliver their missions. And an important aspect of this is a strong and independent board of directors, which is successful in procuring resources for the institution, guiding the organization by its funding principles, and encouraging innovation and delivery uh, when necessary. In a way, what this says is that the board is not just a support structure, it's not just there to help you as executive directors or to help the organization when it's needed or when, it's, when this is requested. The board uh, seems to be there for more than that. Um, it almost, it should feel, the, the board should feel that they own the organization, that they are responsible for the organization. And so when we think about the board, we have to first understand the different types of think tanks that are out there. And I'm not going to uh, provide you with a, uh, a complete list of definitions or functions, but let me use this um, typology presented by Diane Stone. Um, she talks about independent civil society think tanks, so think tanks that have been established as a not-for-profit organization, an NGO, um, policy research institutes which might be located or affiliated within a university, so they are within the structure of a university. Uh, governmentally created or state-sponsored think tanks, which might be owned by or might be set up within a government department or within a government body. Corporate created think tanks or, or business affiliated think tanks, which might be linked to or within maybe a, a trade union, a uh, chamber of commerce, uh, even a corporation. A political party or candidate uh, linked think tank, which might be within the party or affiliated to the party or very closely linked to the party. What this suggests is that there will be different, uh, uh, to, if you want, um, legal status of these organizations, right? Because there will be legislation that governs um, a, a corporate created think tank, a, a think tank that has been created as a for-profit for organization. And there will be other, other bits of legislation that will govern how an NGO is, is, is governed and how it's managed. So there will be uh, uh, needs that the think tanks will have satisfied in terms of setting up their boards, depending on the kind of board that they are. But in general, boards should fulfill some of the following roles. Um, this is from the UK Charity Commission, but it applies to boards around, around the world. For instance, a board is there to ensure that the think tank is carrying out its purposes. Um, if it's an NGO, for example, if it's a charity, it should be for the public benefit. Um, uh, the board is there to, to make sure that the think tank complies um, with its own governing documents and, and with the law. Uh, it's there to act in the think tank's best interests. It's there to manage the think tank's resources responsibly. So it's there to make sure 
that the resources of the organization are managed responsibly, whether it's income or, or reserves or capital and assets, um, is there to act with reasonable care and skill for the organization and for the staff of the organization, and is there to ensure that the think tank is accountable uh, to its stakeholders, to its staff, to, to the law, and to other, other players. In addition, um, you could consider that individual board members, not just the board, but the board members themselves, um, should be there to bring different points of view to a discussion. They should be there to give insights um, into your beneficiaries or your audience's needs and exp expertise or experiences. They should be there to make contacts in the community or within stake among the stakeholders of your organization. And they should be there to come up with new ways of doing things. So the board is not just there to you know, review your, your annual, annual report and, and give you a go ahead or um, uh, you know, um, stamp of, uh, of approval to your plans for next year. It should be there to recommend ways of working, to give you new ideas, to help you make new contacts to help you reach out to new audiences or even to your existing audiences. But they don't always deliver and some of you have mentioned some of these dilemmas and some of the reasons why uh, boards don't always deliver this kind of support um, in an organization. Uh, one of the things that tends to happen is that they spend a lot of time on the trivial rather than the fundamental. They get bogged down into very detailed discussions about um, the, 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 the style or the font used in a publication um, by the think tank, or they get um, broke down into discussions around the detailed number of projects that an organization is running. What they really should be looking at much at, at the broader picture. They might have a short-term bias where the board concentrates on day-to-day -day items that could be very easily handled by staff and should be handled by staff. Um, they might have a reactive stance. Uh, the boards might be set up and they might think that they have to respond to staff initiatives all the time. So they're there just to uh, be told what staff wants to do, um, but not make any recommendations, not make any suggestions at all. Um, maybe they are constantly redoing, rehashing, uh, sorry, reviewing, rehashing, and redoing. And the, spend is spending, the board is spending way too much time checking what the staff has already done or what the management has already decided when this is really management function. So this is the role of the executive director, not of the board. There might be some leaky accountability. So for instance, members of the board might go around the president or the executive director and go to staff members and tell them, look, I'm interested in working on education policy in this particular part of the country. I mean, I think you should be working on that. Or they might uh, contact a funder and then take this funder directly to a member of staff and say, um, here, there's a project for you, without consulting with the executive director or with the senior management. And this is quite challenging for some uh, executive directors, um, depending on the relationship they have with their board. Finally, there's a challenge of diffuse authority, where the responsibilities of the president or the executive director and the board are not, are not well defined. And it's not very clear who's, who's supposed to be doing what or who's responsible for what. And you can read more about this in Ray Strike's um, books on think tank management. Um, we've written a series on think tanks, but the books are excellent. And he provides um, a lot of illustration about these, uh, these challenges. So now let me talk about the different types of boards that exist. Now there are many, but we have identified three main types of boards that we think cover most of the boards that we, we come across um, in think tanks all over the world. And they all face the challenges that I've just mentioned in, to different degrees, and in some cases they face more, some more than others. So the first one is corporate boards. Think about these, uh, these are very similar to the boards of, uh, of for-profit organizations. They are above the organization. They are independent of, of the organization. Uh, and according to Ray Strike, a corporate, corporate board's role can have three aspects to it. The legal, the functional, and the symbolic. 
So in some countries, um, CSO legislation, civil society legislation, will demand that an organization has a corporate board um, to govern it, that own the organization in, in practical terms. They can't take any profits home with them, but they are owners of the organization and they are responsible for the organization and they are separate from the uh, think tank. That means that staff members are not part of the board. Right? So its members are not staff of the think tank. Although the board might include a representative from the staff and even the executive director, but um, as a way of um, strengthening the ties between the board and the organization itself. This is going to be led by a chair, chairperson, and it usually has the responsibility of appointing the executive director, who in turn has the responsibility of appointing and overseeing staff, the organization, and dealing with the think tank's day-to-day -day activities. For instance, the Overseas Development Institute in London has a corporate board. Grupo Faro in Ecuador has a corporate board. So you can have corporate boards in different contexts. If I am to give you an opinion, I think I like this kind of board because it, it, it provides a clear separation between um, the governance, the long-term governance of the organization and the shorter term day-to-day um, -day management of the organization. There's another kind of board which uh, we could describe as a membership board uh, or an assembly. And an assembly consists of associates or partners to an organization which in the world of think tanks, it usually is the researchers or the founding members. So, the, the, and this is tricky because it means that those who are doing the research are also making strategic long-term decisions around how resources are going to be allocated, who is going to be running the day-to-day -day of the organizations, who is going to be the executive director, etc. Now the assembly would be the highest governing body and it would choose the executive director and executive council and other governing bodies or management bodies. But often in these kind of uh, organizations where they have a membership board, those people who participate in the executive direct as executive directors or the executive council would be members of that assembly and possibly even members of staff. This is led by a president which is elected Whereas um, in, the, uh, in the case of, um, uh, um, of, a, of a corporate board, uh, this person might come from outside, the president would have to be a, a member of, of, of the organization, uh, or it could be led by an executive director, um, which uh, while his or her mandate lasts. Um, because the assembly usually involves everybody, there is an executive council that acts more as a management committee uh, than a board of directors, and it's in charge of day-to-day -day activities. And the strategic de decisions by the executive director and the executive council must be appro approved by the assembly. So if you get a sense that in this kind of board, there's a lot of checks and balances, there's a lot of participation, um, and there's very little division between those who are governing the organization in the long term and those who are running the organization in the short term. It has its pros and it has its cons, and we'll get to that in a second. But for instance, in Peru, um, one of the oldest think tanks and one of the strongest think tanks, the Instituto de Estudios Peruanos, has a researchers-led membership board. Finally, you have um, another set of boards which we're calling secondary boards. And these boards um, may support and sometimes replace the official boards. And they include advisory boards or councils. These can be national or international. So some think tanks will choose to have, besides their own boards, their, their official boards, they'll choose to have an advisory board where they might involve um, experts in the field, uh, top academics, um, even politicians, um, policymakers that might give them extra information, but are not going to be uh, involved in the in the in the kind of financial, the governance, the strategic aspects of the organization. Uh, some think tanks set up um, uh, program specific boards uh, or technical boards to address uh, a project, a large program, an initiative that they have. Others will set up a board for funders. So to avoid having your funder in your board, in your corporate board, for, for example, which might create some conflicts of interest, some organizations set up a separate 
uh, board uh, for your funders. So funders can sit there and they can um, discuss the future of the organization, but those recommendations are not legally binding for the organization. And then the main boards, whether it's corporate board or a membership board, might set up uh, subcommittees to address the specific challenges that the organization is facing. For example, a sustainability challenge or an HR challenge or a communication uh, uh, issue. Maybe it's planning to um, invest heavily in a new website. Well, it might not be a bad idea to ask your board to set up a small task team or a subcommittee to help you look into this. So they differ from the board of directors in, in that um, they don't have a day-to-day um, so they might have a day-to-day -day role in the organization activities, but unlike the board of directors, these boards do not have any fiduciary responsibility and so are not responsible for the institution's audit or state of its finances. So they're not responsible for running the think tank or for keeping an eye on the think tank. They are there as support to the executive director, to the board itself, or to the staff. So there are some pros and cons of these different types of boards. First, let's start with the corporate board. So as a great positive is that a corporate board, which remember is separate from the organization, uh, usually has clearer roles and responsibilities. It's independent from staff, so there are no conflicts of interest. And because it's external, it can actually bring in external and professional help and support. So you can decide that, uh, well, you know, we should have a member of the board who is an expert in fundraising, or we should have a member of the board who has uh, legal expertise in uh, civil society legislation because we are facing challenges in our current, uh, in our country right now. Um, you're going to be able to bring an expert from outside um, into, your, into your board. The negative um, um, aspect of a corporate board is that, and some of you have mentioned this, it can be sometimes too far removed from the think tank. Right? So they're not connected to the think tank, they, they rarely visit them, they're not really sure what they do, so it's very hard to get them to engage. Right? So they might be hard to manage as well for the executive director, and they might provide or create uh, risks in third-party affiliations. So. Um, you might have a board member uh, who is also a member of other boards, or who is also uh, working in certain fields, who might be an independent consultant, who might be doing consultancy for a corporation or for an interest group that is in sort of in contradiction to the values or to the interests of your organization. So that's something that you would have to manage yourselves. Membership boards have positives and negatives as well. So uh, the membership board, well, they, the members of the board will be very well acquainted with the think tank because they're likely to be part of the think tank. Uh, the membership board promotes a great uh, degree of ownership among, among the members of the board. So they're not going to be very removed from the organization. Um, and usually the decisions of a membership board tend to stick. Now they take a lot longer to make those decisions because they usually uh, are governed by a very strong democratic principles. But once a decision is made, then that decision might, might stick and will survive uh, many discussions. However, a membership board is going to find it very hard to balance individual researchers' interests because you'll have among the members of the board many researchers. Now, if the organization has to make a tough decision about, for instance, cutting a certain program because it's just not bringing in, in any funds or because uh, it's no longer of relevance to the organization's mission, those researchers who are also in the board might oppose this. And this is going to make it very hard to the, for the board to make a decision and for the think tank to move on. Because decisions will take time. There will be a lot of discussion um, around, around um, how the organization should develop. For, for example, there might be a window of opportunity coming up um, in the political um, um, scene. The, the corporate board might be able to quickly help the executive director decide to shift tactic or to create a new program or to launch a new communication campaign. The membership board 
will be much slower in that respect. Um, all the members will probably have a say, and unless the decision is very obvious, uh, they might uh, uh, miss out on these uh, windows of, of opportunity. Finally, a membership board also has a different, uh, another challenge, which is it's harder to bring in external professional help. So the, if, the, if the organization is struggling uh, to deal with a um, human resources challenge, it's uh, struggling to deal with um, how to overhaul its communication or how to improve its uh, research capacity. Um, bringing in an expert into the board might be a way of addressing this, but they won't be able to because to be a member of the board, you have to be a member of the organization and the organization might have rules about this. Now, on the second secondary boards, there are many pros. Of course, they can help you address the specific needs. Uh, you can, you can uh, create them and uh, close them as necessary. They're flexible. They can take many shapes and forms. And they're external in the sense that they can bring that professional help and support that you need. So if you have a membership board, you can bring in an ex expert into your, into your board to help you with a specific problem. You might want to set up a secondary board to address that specific problem. Um, and that might be a way of so sorting out some of those weaknesses of the membership board. On the other hand, um, having too many, mem too many secondary boards can add complexity and cost to the management of the, of the organization. And of course, they have very low accountability. They're not accountable really to the organization or to any legal bodies. And so that might create some challenges. So let me ask, before I ask for any questions um, about, about these pros and cons, um, how many of you have corporate boards and how many of you have membership boards? Do you want to share this over, over in the chat? So, Moshen from Iran, you have a membership board, and Apoorna, you have a corporate board. Um, Georgiana from, you have a membership board, membership board, corporate board, corporate board, Sophie. So, it's quite even. Emmanuel, corporate, Alan, corporate. So, Sylvester, you also have a secondary board. What kind of secondary board is this, Sylvester? Professionals. Okay, great. So most of those, most of you present uh, today um, have corporate boards, but some of you have uh, membership boards. And I don't know if you recognize some of these, um, some of these pros and cons in, in your own boards. Um, but can you, can you think of any, any, other, um, any other pros or cons for those kinds of boards? Thinking of your own organizations, can you think of any uh, positive aspects uh, of the kind of board you have or any negative aspects of the kinds of boards that you have? And if you'd like to join in, with uh, by 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 speaking, just let me know, and I will un unmute you. So Emmanuel recognizes some of the pros and cons, but are, are there any other, or can you share an example, an experience uh, that might illustrate um, one of them? Sylvester, you talk about volunteerism. Is that what do you mean by that? That um, so there's a lot of volunteerism from membership boards that people have to do this um, in a volunteer as volunteers. You mean because most think tank boards would be uh, on a volunteer basis. You mean they give their, their time and expertise without cost? Yes, I mean, that's, that's one of the great advantages of having a, a good board. If you, if you create a, uh, your board um, pro properly, if you're smart in the way you set it up, 
you'll get a lot of, uh, of very um, high quality expert input at no cost. And that's something we're gonna look into in a minute. I think one of the challenges of uh, corporate boards, I think that's what you're referring to, Alan, is that the board is regularly informed about uh, what the staff is doing. Yes, because they are a little bit removed from the board. Right? So not so for the organization, they're not close. They don't, they're not in the organization. They're not part of the organization. A membership board, on the other hand, the members are part of the organization, so they're more likely to know what staff is, um, is up to. Okay, let me, um, let me move on then into the next, next sections. So what is an ideal board composition, right? So, so Sophie, uh, so before I move on, Sophie, there's some distance when director is gatekeeping information from the organization and staff to the board and vice versa. Another one is that board members might not be well attuned to aspects of topics of the organization that is working. Um, and Emmanuel says, one con is when a board start bringing in their own friends, relatives, and employment for employment, and they may not be competent. Okay, okay. So I think with this, uh, these two last comments are very, very important, and they point at uh, two things that we're going to look into right now. The first one is um, the setup of the board. Who should be on the board? Okay, and the second one is has to do with the relationship between the board and the and the organization. Now, I think from your comments, it's very clear, and I hope this is coming across and will come across uh, clear at the end, is that boards should not be treated, you know, lightly. It should not be something that you set up um, um, in a in a in a rush um, and and the board members should not just be the friends of the executive director. Right, um, their roles are very. The roles are very important uh, for the health of the organization, and therefore we must we must take a lot of care um, into that. So let me talk about the ideal composition of a board, and I think this is going to uh, address some of these challenges because we get asked about this a lot. Now, how large should it be? Of course, this is going to um, depend um, on the so so that. The specific composition, sorry, will depend on the size of the organization. Uh, it will depend on the scope of the board. It will uh, it'll depend on the legal requirements that the organization will face. Right? So there might be some legal requirements uh, in your country regarding boards. And so you have to comply with those. Okay. Now, I think a combination um, might not be a bad idea. You, it might not be a bad idea to have uh, a corporate board and a secondary board to address some issues that the organization might want to address closer to um, to its staff. Uh, or you might want to have a membership board because that's where you are, that's the organization you are, and, and you might want to add, complement that with a, a board uh, where you bring in expertise from outside the organization. Now, you are, if you're doing this, you might be able to divide the political responsibilities of a membership board from the executive, executive ones. But I would still recommend that you should try to be simple. Some organizations that we come across are just too heavy on the top. They have too many boards, and this creates a huge burden on the executive director and some staff when it comes to managing them. So how, how large should they be? First thing, they should be manageable. All right. So if you're a small organization, um, then five to, five to seven members is probably fine. If you're a much larger organization, and you are you know, 60 people plus, 50 people plus, you have um, 20 projects a year, 30 projects a year, maybe 10 people might, uh, 10 people or more might be a good idea because you might be facing a lot more challenges than a much smaller think tank. Um, this is something that you're going to have to be uh, addressing as you go and your executive director should have the prerogative of um, inviting new members to the board um, as and when he or she sees fit. Skills. This is very important. Often what happens is that boards uh, are set up uh, with a, a policy issue or a research discipline in mind. So 
the executive directors or whoever decided to set up the think tank will convene a board which is made up of the, the most uh, intelligent, the most inspiring, um, the most famous uh, academics they can think of. Or they might bring in some uh, very well-respected policymakers or politicians or personalities or business leaders. Right? So the VIPs of your country. And that might help you with symbolic aspects of the board. That might help you with uh, gaining access to spaces. Um, but these uh, individuals are unlikely to be able to help you deal with the day-to-day -day management issues of that a think tank faces or day-to-day -day accounting or financial challenges that a, th that a think tank director has to deal with. They won't help you with um, communication strategies, PR strategies, marketing of your work. So they won't have that expertise and they might not have that interest as well. And this is very important. The board should be there to help the executive director and the organization to deal with all of these challenges. So it's not a good idea to set up a board um, where you don't have a mix of skills, of the kind of skills that the organization needs to run itself. Now, the, roles, the board is going to have different roles. Some of those roles might be legal, financial, intellectual, of course, to suggest ideas and uh, areas of work to look into, but also it has a crucial role, which is to support the executive director. Now, how often should they be involved? Um, this, again, will depend on the size of the board, it will depend on the size of the organization, but um, think of it in this way. The board should have an annual involvement in the sense that it shouldn't just you should involve them one year, not the next year, maybe the next year, but they should be continuous. They should always be there and present, and there should be at least an annual cycle of meetings or discussions. They should have a strategic involvement, so they should be there to address strategic issues. So perfect moment to involve your board um, and for the board to be involved and, and, and to work on issues is around your planning cycles. But they should also be around for on-demand uh, requests and to represent you when necessary. So they should be committed to the organization and to your, uh, to your mission. Now, this means that you have to have a very good relationship between your board and the staff. This is a, um, uh, a, a, a quote from Simon Maxwell, who used to be director of the Overseas Development Institute. Um, and he, he says uh, the following, it's important to recognize that good corporate governance requires that the board own the institution strategy. So they have to feel that the institution strategy is their own, right? That, that this is something they have to defend and protect. Now, sometimes the staff, including the director, who after all is reporting to the board, think that the institution is theirs and that they can do whatever they want with it. But that's not true. The director and the staff do not own the institution. They work there. It's the board that owns the institution. Now, what they can do is help shape the board's thinking, um, which is a power of, of a kind. And, of course, staff do most of the work on the strategy so they can adapt it and change it as it's uh, implemented. And this is an interesting quote because it, um, it illustrates the relationship, the real relationship between the board and the staff. There's a tension there between ownership, between delivery, between design that is going to exist all the time. But this is healthy. There's constant debate and discussion between the board and the staff with the director in the middle, but not, as a, not necessarily as a gatekeeper, but more as a facilitator of, this, of, of dialogue um, is, uh, is going to be beneficial for the organization because it's going to avoid many of the things you've mentioned before. The board will be aware of what the staff is thinking about, what the staff thinks of, believes, wants, etc. And the staff will be aware or be confident that the board has their, their, their best interest in mind. Now let's, let's think about a relationship between the, um, the board and the executive director or, or with senior management. Now this, this demands that we strike some sort of balance. Um, on the one hand, the executive director works for the board, so he or she is appointed by the board. 
But on the other hand, the board must be supportive of the executive director's strategy and needs. So um, it's in nobody's interest that the board simply tells the executive director what to do, right? So the board has to hire someone that they trust will take things forward with, uh, without them having to be involved in every single decision. Now, boards must own the think tank, not by saying, you do what I say, but by taking direct responsibility for appointing, managing, and replacing the director, supporting the director in building his or her senior management so that the director is able to deliver the mission, and by opening up spaces for the director and senior management and even staff members to achieve the think tank's mission. So this is ownership in a different way. So it's not ownership as in, I own you, you do what I say, and I take profits home. But this is ownership in taking responsibility for the health of the organization. And you'll probably notice by now that this takes a particular kind of person. Not everybody is going to be a good think tank board member. Now, don't forget that the executive directors have the power to shape their boards um, and the membership of the board. And therefore, they have the power to shape their sense of ownership. They can appoint new members. They can change the term. They can suggest changes to the terms of reference of the board so that they take on more responsibilities or they uh, give the responsibilities back to the organization. And they can do this by keeping the board, the board informed and engaged. And there are many ways in which you can, you can do this. You can uh, organize um, um, weekly or bi-weekly meetings with some key board members, for example. Not with everybody, not with every single member of your board who will probably not sign up to weekly meetings, but you might identify among those board members one or two that are key to your needs, um, are close to you, and you might be able to consult with them on a regular basis. You might want to write uh, a letter to the board before any board meeting, providing them uh, information on key issues, preparing them for any decisions that you want them to, uh, to make, um, uh, and, and making sure that when your board is fully informed, um, they will come into meetings well prepared, they'll be aware of the challenges and ready to dive into core topics. It's of no use to have a board um, that is uh, only engaged in the organization when you have a board meeting for those hours or those days that you have the board meeting. You have to keep them involved uh, and the best way is just to keep them informed of what the organization is doing. So for example, we at, uh, at Think Tanks, um, we try having a newsletter just for the board members. Um, uh, or um, I send emails, personal emails, to each one of them on specific issues every once in a while. Uh, and that is a way of making sure that they are continued involved. Sophie adds, uh, if I can add, we have a board executive committee, three members, to facilitate the communication between ED and the whole board, um, but avoiding having to talk to the entire board all the time. That's an excellent way of addressing this. So that's the board might recognize that this is a good way of, um, of keeping a close relationship with the organization um, and having a subgroup of them represent them in discussions with the executive director. Um, that works really well. It can also be a way in which the executive director tries to improve his or her relationship with the board. So this, can come, this, this solution could come from, um, from both, um, uh, both sides. Now, what about the relationship between the board and staff? Again, we have to find and strike a balance. On, one, on the one hand, um, the board needs to understand what the researchers are arguing about and talking and discussing and studying. Um, uh, but on the other hand, um, um, they have to avoid imposing their views on uh, think tank's agenda. So um, if you have a board that is very close to the researchers, you might feel, you might uh, notice that the, the researchers start to look up at the board and say, what should I study? What should I be looking at? What should I be working on? And you have to avoid that. But you want them to be close. You want them to know. As a question from Manuel, uh, I'll, ask in, I'll answer in a second, Manuel. Um, now, a way of thinking about this is that um, boards should not be kept out of sight, and this is something that 
Um, it's often said, you know, boards should be out, out of sight. I don't think so. I don't think boards should be kept out of, out of sight. I think um, all staff members in a think tank should know who the board members are, and they should know that they can approach them if necessary. It would, it's a good practice to approach them via your directors, um, but you should feel that you, you should be able to approach them. And the way of, of ensuring that they're not kept out of sight, but they're not on top of you, is, uh, by, um, is, is, is by the board providing a, sound, a sounding board to researchers' ideas, for example. The board can act as a sounding board. I remember when I was at ODI, um, when there was a board meeting in the organization, uh, the executive director, Simon Maxwell, would organize um, kind of parallel sessions where different um, research groups would present to some members of the board your, our, our work. So we would present uh, our latest research or some ideas we were developing, and those members of the board who were there would provide us with some feedback and some ideas. Boards can actually offer middle managers and team leaders some support and advice from time to time. It might be that they have certain expertise in management and fundraising, and communication, or in certain research methods or policy areas. And it's not a bad idea um, to connect those leaders with board members um, at these board meetings or at any other moment in time during the year, but in a very organized way. Uh, the boards might be involved as well, acting as moderators or even panelists at events. So they, this is an excellent way of getting high-level, high-profile moderators or panelists at your events if you are short of um, someone. Uh, but it also means that the board will be more aware of the kind of things you're organizing, the kind of things you're doing in, in your think tank. And you could, at times, involve them in a research project. Of course, if this is a membership board you're talking about, they will be involved in research projects. But if this is a corporate board, you might want to bring them in uh, as advisors. Um, they might even have a small role simply because they have a clear expertise in the subject. You have to be very careful about paying them and how to uh, reward them in this respect. But uh, it's not a bad idea to try to involve them in projects uh, from time to time and in some way or the other. Of course, staff should also think that their board members are part of your audience, right? So if you are out there trying to convince uh, the policy community that they should uh, adopt universal basic in income, for example, you should also think that you must convince your board that universal, universal basic income is a good idea. And if they're not convinced, you're going to have to um, communicate with them as well as you would be communicating with the media or with policymakers. You have to make sure that they are part of your audience. There was a, there was a comment, and I think this comes in this, in this section, but I'll, I'll say it before. There was a question by Emmanuel about um, whether it's a good strategy to rotate boards every five, to, to, uh, like every five years. Let me, um, let me go back to the... Um, slide about the ideal board um, composition. Um, yes, so the question, uh, should we rotate uh, the board members? The answer is yes. Um, change them all in one go? No. Um, change them, change them uh, progressively. So as I said before, executive directors have the power to shape the board. Um, and they can do this. Um, uh, they can do this by um, presenting them with uh, a strategy that you know, pushes the board in a particular direction. They can do this by appointing new members to the board uh, and also uh, suggesting changes because maybe a board member has not been present uh, in the, the last two or three board meetings. So you know, maybe that person just is, or is not really interested or is not able to participate. Um, the executive director might make suggestions about changes to the terms of reference of the board, so what are their roles and responsibilities. So yes, the, the executive director can certainly make uh, changes to the board composition, and it's a good idea for the board composition to evolve over time. Uh, it, would be a, it would not be good practice to keep the same board for 10 or 20, or 20 years. Um, you know, even in the face of uh, changes in your context, changes in your staff, changes in the issues you're addressing. 
let me, uh, let me move forward because um, we're running out of time. And finally, these are some of the questions you might want to ask uh, yourselves. Um, you know, um, how, do, how do I make sure that the board is actually supporting us? You, know, you should ask yourself a few questions. If you want to make sure that the, the board helps us to ensure that we're carrying out our purposes, then you need to ask yourself, do they understand what is it that we do, uh, what is it that we are? I've come across many board members who do not know what a think tank is or what a think tank does. So they were approached by the executive director as a favor uh, to them. They probably know what an NGO is, they know what a university is, but they have very little experience with think tanks. And so they're not necessarily the best board members for a think tank. If the board has to make sure that it complies with the think tank's governing document and the law, then you need to ask yourselves, if, if they understand the law and what is required from them. If it's about acting in the think tank's best interest, then you need to ask yourself if your board members are well aware of what the think tank is working on and if there are any conflicts of interest. Uh, if the board is there to manage the think tank's resources responsibly, then you need to make sure that they know what the risks that you face are, um, and then you need to make sure that they are on top of your finances. Uh, this might not be the case, but you must make sure that this is the case, uh, etc. So um, it's not enough to um, set up your, you know, set up your board, uh, pick the right people, uh, you know, give them the right terms of reference. I think the organisation has to actively communicate with the board and actively engage with the board to make sure that they are aware of your of the opportunities, the threats you you face, your strengths and your weaknesses because they are going to need all this information to make decisions that are going to affect you in the future. And Apuna uh, asks a question, when do we get to know what are, when do we get to know that we are providing an overdose of information to board members, considering that they are not involved in day-to-day -day business of the organization? Well, the first thing is that they will tell you enough. Um, board members will say, I, I did not sign up for this, right? Um, I did not sign up for a daily email. Uh, but this is the role of the executive director. The ED has to talk to the board and, uh, and agree with them the kind of information that they will receive, how they will receive it, and when, and, and who is going to send it to them. It might be that they prefer that all communications come through the ED. But it might be that they say, well, you know, only the formal bits come, must come from the ED, but we would also like to get to make sure we are signed up to your newsletter, follow you on Facebook and Twitter, etc. I think if you are in the communication side of the think tank, you would want to know whether your board uh, members are reading your work. Um, this is something that you should certainly pay, pay attention to. And it might be that they prefer to access information in different ways, and so it's not a bad idea to think about that. So let me finish with a couple of um, examples. Um, I, won't, I won't take too long. Uh, it's just, just to illustrate what I mean to say. So executive board transitions and mentoring and informing research agendas. I was part of a, a recruitment at the Overseas Development Institute uh, some time ago. Um, a long time ago, actually. And, um, and I, I, so, but I, it was very interesting for me because I was able to see firsthand how the board of directors of the organization and in particular the chair of the board, uh, took on the responsibility of finding the new executive, executive director. Um, the current executive director, Simon Maxwell at the time, announced he was leaving, and so he, he took a step back in any discussions around his replacement. This was handled entirely by the chair of the board, working with human resources uh, department in the organization, ODI is a large think tank, so it had a human resources department, but it was, it was the chair of the board who took on the responsibility of developing a job description, of contacting headhunting agency, of setting up uh, the interview panels, um, which were in, included board members and also staff, and managing the whole process. And I think this was very important because it provided huge stability and it awarded a lot of confidence to the process. And so if you are an organization and your board is not involved in this process, staff is going to feel, so who's, who's in charge? You know, our director is leaving in a few months and we don't know who's going to uh, make sure that we have a leader um, 
when he or she leaves or before or afterwards. Funders might also, might also worry. Funders might say, well, if this person leaves, uh, who's going to be in charge? Who's going to take over? Um, uh, who do we talk to if we have any questions about financial management of the organization? So it's important that the board is seen by your internal and your external stakeholders as opening the organization and taking full responsibility for these transitions. And the other case is of a think, of a think tank in Central America, which um, I think the structure has already changed. But I always found it very interesting that they had a, a very large secondary membership board um, that was divided into smaller commissions, and each one was focused on a specific policy uh, research area. So, um, in a sense, each program, each research program, had its own advisory board. And, and it provided um, an awful lot of inputs, uh, a sounding board for the researchers. At times, it was hard to strike the right balance between uh, being there to, to help and imposing the agenda a little bit. But I think most of the time, it meant that the researchers felt they had a very high level and very timely support from their board members, um, who were very active in, um, in the organization. So this was a way of taking full advantage of the commitment and the motivation of membership board members um, to help the organization um, and to make it uh, dynamic and flexible and reactive. Rather than having all of them talk about everything, they divided them into specific um, policy-focused uh, groups, and so they could have a much more intimate, much more flexible, uh, much more engaging conversations with different members of the organization. Any questions? Right. Um, okay, so Alan asks, um, conflicts of interest, how can we manage board members who are leading companies or organizations with similar actions that the think tank? Um, can you, so let me suggest an example, not, not knowing what organization you work for, Alan. So for example, um, a think tank might include among its board members uh, the executive director of, of KPMG, um, which is an accounting firm, but also a consultancy firm. And as part of its work, it advises uh, governments. So your think tank might be uh, provided information um, it might be providing advice, it might be advocating for policy change uh, to the government on certain issues, and uh, this uh, KPMG or PwC or any, any other of these large uh, consulting firms might be doing the same, but they'll do it in a different way. They'll do it through consultancy. They won't be doing it publicly. Um, there might be some conflict of interest. Uh, maybe you are suggesting something that goes against what PwC or KPMG might be suggesting to the government, um, and so that might uh, generate some, some concerns. One, one of the things to make sure it's very clear to anybody who looks at this list of members of the board is that the members of the board do not necessarily represent the organizations. So if the director of KPMG is a member of the board, uh, he or she is a member of the board because of who they are, as an individual and not because they happen to be the director of KPMG or PwC. So it's important that if you have someone there who is a, a politician, for example, that the politician is not there representing a party, they just happen to be members of a party. And I think this is uh, very important. Um, when uh, we talk to new think tanks, we often hear they uh, planning the list of, uh, they're writing down the list of board members and they say, oh, we want somebody to represent the government. We want somebody to represent the private sector. And this is, this is not what you should be looking for. You should be looking for people who represent themselves um, and they are in their own right uh, experts or individuals who you might find to be ethically uh, sound and trustworthy. Um, another thing is you have to be public about these things. So the more public you are about who your members are and what um, what personal, private, professional interests they have is going to help preempt any possible uh, conflicts of interest in the future. Is gender a key point to consider in board uh, setting up? Yes. Um, 
but not just gender. I think diversity in general. I mean, there is um, there is enough research already for us to uh, confidently, confidently say that um, diversity is good for uh, organizations, not just uh, within the the, the organization, but at the board level, uh, it has a positive effect in the organization's uh, effectiveness, uh, governance, etc. So it's a good thing to be diverse. So gender, definitely. You remember, your board is giving you direction, is giving you, is giving you a, a long-term uh, a vision, mission, and therefore you should be incorporating you know, the views of half of your population, at the very least. But you should also think that your board should incorporate the views and the experiences of different sectors of the population, uh, maybe people who come from different parts of the country even, if your think tank is a think tank that is trying to affect policy at the national level as well. So diversity is a key thing in board composition. Uh, a motion? I think you've raised your hand. Let me see. Uh, I've unmuted you. You can now. Uh, I think I've unmuted you. No. Mm. Motion. I can. I can unmute you for some reason. Eva, can you unmute um, Motion, please? Oh, so you, you didn't have a, a comment, okay. Um, about the, Hector says something about the account. It's important to show the finance to the board So the question is, it's important to show your finances to your board. You must show your finances to your board. It must be extremely clear. Um, the board must have all the information. Uh, if the question is, as I think it is, uh, to show your finances to the public, uh, we at On Think Tanks, we advocate for transparency. And so we do believe that uh, it's in Think Tank's best interest to, um, to show their, um, their accounts. Um, as much as possible and uh, as clearly as possible to um, to the public uh, in general and this is going to help you address an awful lot of challenges that might emerge in the future if there are any doubts about the sources of funding that you receive or the conclusions of some of your work and this is certainly something that boards can help you with and they should uh, be the ones to approve this and to advocate for this within the organization. Any other questions? Okay. So, so this is the this is the presentation. Um, I've tried to give you um, um, kind of an overview of why governance is uh, important, why why the, the role that boards can uh, play, and um, and and how to set them up. And before I go, there's one last question. Um, Sophie asks, how can staff be best involved in the appointment of board members? Sorry for the late question. Okay, so. Let me, uh, let me finish with um, trying to answer that question, Sophie. Um, the point I've been trying to make is that governance is important and that boards play a crucial role in this. And, and, and if they are so important in the governance of an organization, then we need to pay a lot of attention on how they are set up, so what is their, their, their composition, and, uh, and what are the roles that they, that they play. Which means that we have to pay a lot of attention to who sets them up and for what, and 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 to the point Sophie, the question Sophie made in the, in the end. So it's very good practice, in my view, for the executive director to consult with its staff, whether it's senior management or general staff, about the board members. Who should be new members? Who could be new board members if there is already an existing board 
um, and we want to make some recommendations, who could we recommend? Some, some organizations will include among the members of the board a, a representative of the staff. They won't have any, 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 they won't have the same rights as the rest of the members, but they will be there to um, put forward the views of staff directly to the board. So these are ways in which you can involve the staff in, in appointing the board, in holding the board to account, uh, in informing the board, and even in, um, in helping the board make decisions that work for, for everybody. Um, if you're interested in, in learning more about boards or about management in general for think tanks, we will be having more of these, uh, uh, we're having another course on think tank uh, governance and management later in the year. Um, you can sign up through the own think tank site. Um, the best way to find out when these are coming up is to sign up to a newsletter or to Twitter or Facebook. Um, we also have an Instagram account or a LinkedIn. So whatever works for you. Um, but also to get in touch, um, we're easy to find. And so feel free to send us a, a quick message or an email and we'll be very happy to address any of your questions um, and help you find more information about think tanks management and boards and Eva is sharing in the chat box um, links to the, the course that will be taking place in November if you're interested in, in joining us. Um, and this is all from me and I hope you've um, enjoyed this and, um, and again as I said thanks for joining and we'll see you soon.